got a big round of applause for everybody here. We are uh, raucous and wild here at the Heartland, and if you hear a lot of thundering noises in the background, that would be the construction that is going on. Uh, we are getting a new, a new revamped L station here at Morrison Lunt. The actual uh, work on the tracks to strengthen them is going on uh, for the next few weekends, and then on June 29th, I believe, the station will be closed for six weeks. So uh, we are really appreciative of all the infrastructure work going on, not only in Chicago, in our neighborhood, but around the country. We want more of it. We want a massive program of, of uh, rebuilding our bridges and rebuilding our roads. I remember when Eisenhower built those highways in the old days. Back in the 50s, it was a big deal. Now you, you, you know, it destroyed little businesses. If, now you have to turn left off the interstate and try to find some place to go. But it's, uh, you can get there faster and more directly. Okay. Um, I was out of town when the great events of uh, June, what was it, May 19th, 20th, around, it was a couple weekends ago. Uh, originally we had the G8 uh, summit who was going to be here and the, the NATO meeting was going to be here. Uh, the, the president pulled G8 out, which was a pretty smart move because it cut the number of demonstrators down, but there was a lot of energy uh, put into this uh, NATO event by not only the city, the federal government, the state government, community organizers, activists everywhere. There was a lot of discussion. Uh, I had to go out of town for family matters and a kid's graduation, and I'm just uh, finally going to get the word from one of the horse's mouth. Tom, you were there. You were uh, with the community media workshop. Uh, you were active. You were uh, uh, emailing. You were webbing. You were sending stuff around. You were interviewing people. You were talking. You were covering. Give us a summation of what went on at the NATO event. Well, what went on is pretty much what I feared was going to happen back in the fall, um, which is that stage photo ops of diplomats and some protesters in the streets were kind of the story, but I don't think we ever ended up hearing much about why NATO yeah. in a post-Cold War era, um, which is certainly what some of the protesters are talking about. Um, we had a very forceful demonstration by nurses in their Robin Hood outfits talking about a transaction tax to try to bring some money back into health care for the poor. Um, we had another group that marched in the mayor's house on Saturday continuing to press the case against mental health care cuts. Um, but a lot of those messaging, in, in, including quite frankly what the president I think was hoping to accomplish, which was why do we need a NATO in a post-Soviet era? Um, I don't think came through very well because, um, well, because the mayor himself sort of set up this high security zone frame way back, uh, you know, during the holidays, and we never quite emerged from that. So, what pictures did we get? Well, after a peaceful, family-friendly protest of probably five to ten thousand protesters, not the two thousand that were reported. Um, a couple hundred folks acted out at the end. It was kind of a rugby scrum between uh, police uh, in full riot gear who outnumbered protesters probably five to one. Um, and even the protesters were maybe about 100 at the end and about 200 media, all waiting for a cop to act out. And by and large, I have to say, the cops were pretty well trained and didn't act out as much as they did when you, for instance, Michael, were part of Big Pictures in 1968. So. On one level, the mayor's <laughs> fear of another 68 didn't really happen. No. On the other hand, the public's understanding of why we spent $60 million or more to invite the world when most of them were locked up behind security uh, uh, accordions is, to my mind, still a little bit of a mystery because I'm not sure how boarding up the Chagall mosaic is going to encourage tourism, um, which is what happened. Some of our most uh, precious treasures to show off to the world were in fact closed because of security concerns or because for four days downtown was actually virtually empty yeah, it's except a, it's, for protesters, police, and diplomats. It seems to me from uh, what I saw on the news and on the web and uh, heard about, it was uh, the crowds were certainly not large and we didn't get a lot of tourists coming. Uh, 
And uh, I did, uh, Ben Jarowski actually did a, a story, I believe in the reader, that talked about while this was always go going on, while this was going on, the mayor was doing a bunch of deals, yep. which you could maybe t address. And then um, d Don Rose, who does a uh, column every week, has been a guest on this show and was around back in 68 as well as today. He basically said that the, uh, the mayor won the, uh, the propaganda battle. I Your think take that the on all these. Well, I think that the mayor won a, a certain propaganda battle insofar as the city looked safe, clean, and secure. On the other hand, the city was pretty depopulated and was not the thriving metropolis that you would want to show off. And I think furthermore, there's been, for several generations of mayors, it seemed, because Jane Byrne pushed for a World's Fair out of this kind of second city sensibility. Um, Chicago is a world-class city, and and we know that. You know, every fall, New York City has the world come to the UN, and it doesn't shut down. Um, it used to be every Fourth of July, we'd have a million people downtown, and it didn't shut down. Just a yeah, few years ago, on it. May Day, we had five hundred thousand people marching through the loop in favor of immigration reform. No arrests. The city didn't shut down. So, to a certain extent, the mayor became a victim, I think, of his own framing. To talk about in PR terms. Um, he wanted a safe place for diplomats to come and he essentially scared everybody else away. What do you think about the notion of, uh, the, you know, whether it was conscious or unconscious, uh, the mayor and others involved in this and promoting it and uh, playing the press with it were involved in the demonization of the left and of the progressive movement? Well, I think that there has been some of that going on ever since Occupy took off because Whatever you want to say about Occupy, they created new space for a different part of the debate that the Tea Party started uh, ahead of the 2010 midterm elections. And the Occupy movement last summer and fall kind of took back some of those debating points and created space for the rest of us to jump in. I remember Bernie Dorn on your show not so long ago talking about the opportunity of being out in the street to press our First Amendment rights had been kind of reinvigorated by not only the Occupy movement, but the stand-up folks, the anti-foreclosure folks. I mean, there continue to be, uh, National People's Action uh, trained over 100,000 people this spring to take part in different actions around the country. What I'm beginning to worry about is whether the use of the protest tool has become um, less potent because of the way our, our underlying messages around why we're protesting just aren't picked up by the so-called media anymore. Now, well, some of that I think we have to hold up a mirror because in this internet age, we have so much ability to communicate directly to audiences we're trying to influence. My fear is we're only talking to ourselves and not expanding the choir enough to bring other people in. And when the only option was to come downtown and join with five or 10,000 other people up against a well-equipped police force, I can understand why maybe some people went elsewhere and attended to family business instead of participating in the streets. Uh, I had a, a well, you know, when, while you were talking and uh, you mentioned the media and how we don't really get the, the information. Uh, I think that uh, clearly mass demonstrations do have an effect. You can look at other countries and you can certainly look at what's going on in Quebec. Now yes. how many people know about what's going on in Quebec? In Quebec they tried to uh, raise the tuition rates on a, basically a free education system. There have been massive demonstrations in uh, Quebec, and, uh, in Quebec City and in Montreal. The uh, legislature there passed a draconian measure similar to what they were trying to put through and did in part here that basically uh, you said you had to notify the authorities before you had a demonstration, how many people were going to come, and it's been totally defied. And uh, that those demonstrations have pulled not only students, uh, labor, uh, progressives of all sorts, and it's going on. So I'm not sure that the, the demonstration as an activist tool is over. Uh, we certainly have to figure a way that we uh, uh, we get more information from our media. Our media only does headlines. It doesn't give us depth. It doesn't give us analysis. And we have a serious problem in America. We're kind of dumbed down. I think that's the right yep. term. And uh, I think that there are efforts uh, underway from the communications uh, big boys and some women too 
as well as governments and business, et cetera, to keep us uh, uninformed? Well, we have massive shifting trends in the media landscape as we go to an online environment, and quite frankly, there just are fewer, less experienced reporters covering the news, which makes it more and more incumbent on the rest of us to um, to really dig into the richness that the internet provides and in, in getting us more information. And again, most of us tend to go to the places we're comfortable with where we already agree with folks. Um, I think part of what I'm missing, not that the daily newspaper was ever uh, a panacea, but there was a certain notion of a public square where a discussion about what the elites were doing to us yesterday got got kind of displayed and, and we could kick it around and talk about it and try to occasionally get our stories in there. Well, newspapers still have some influence, but the messaging is far more diffused and, and dispersed. Um, we're going to be doing a bunch of uh, uh, transmittal of tools about this next week at our annual conference, but even that's undersubscribed this year because nonprofits are under such budgetary pressures in this continuing economic recession that we're in. I, uh, I, I'm frustrated by our inability to move beyond the choir, I think is what I want to send here. Not to suggest that street protests or other forms of, of uh, civil disobedience on the one hand or vigorous use of First Amendment rights isn't something we need to c continue to do. Look at Arab Spring and indeed Quebec and whatnot, but uh, somehow we need to break through differently than we have been the, the, the last year or so since Occupy came on the scene. Well, speaking of uh, pre preaching to the choir, uh, I'm not sure where I'm going with that except let's talk about the choir and our reactions to what happened in Wisconsin. You got a couple of words on that? <laughs> well, it seems to me that in a time of economic stress, the amount of money that was spent by the Governor Snot Walker forces, 10 to 1, over uh, folks who were trying to level the playing field again in favor of collective bargaining, um, succeeded in kind of having the working class fighting against the working class. Um, people who have a good union contract were the target from folks who are out of work, facing foreclosure, wondering why those uh, public service workers who are represented by unions had a better deal than they did. A lot of facts got lost, but I think that's part of the frustration many of us have is that facts have become meaningless in an age of uh, sloganeering. And uh, clearly the GOP won the sloganeering. Um, and part of, part of that was just a lot of corporate money. And, and part of it is that there was not a consensus, even amongst folks who were losing collective bargaining rights, that the recall tool was the right way to respond to this issue. And finally, they had a weak candidate to go up against yeah. a sitting governor. Well, I mean, there's a reason why sitting governors don't get tossed out. Um, we had even an issue trying to impeach Bogoyevich, as you recall. It was not an easy thing to do. Um, so I don't see it as the... Um, uh, I'm not as depressed about the long-term results of you don't what think happened in Wisconsin. It'll, it'll, yeah, you still think Obama will pull out the, the polling shows That's that Wisconsin is still a purple state and that Obama is likely to, to win the, uh, the, the popular vote in November and therefore the Electoral College. Um, it is certainly a blow, I think, against organized labor, and that we have to continue to analyze, but that's not anything new. This has been happening for the last generation of a continuing erosion in the influence and number of people in organized labor, and this is something that we will continue to debate and observe why it's happening. Uh, you're listening to the Live from the Heartland show brought to you every Saturday morning from the cozy and bustling corner of Glenwood and Lunt here in the heart of Rogers Park. Uh, we're going to take a short musical break if uh, Eli can play that tune called Irene. It's by the Twin Peaks Band. One of the members is my son, Katie and Lake Jack Henry James, who graduated last night. And we congratulate him and all of the people who graduated from Jones, as well as all the other high schools in Chicago. We congratulate people everywhere who have graduated because you're going forward and we know you're going to work to make it a better world. Uh, you really have no choice. So, uh, I'm going to ask Tom Clark to uh, stay up here while we get Obed Lopez and Carol Lee to come on up and talk to us about uh, Division Street, 1966, all the way up to today into the future. So, if we got the music, or any music, play it, Eli. 
Uh, once again, we're looking for someone to help Eli downtown on a regular basis, so we need an intern. We need someone who wants to help out, and uh, we'll be right back with more Live from the Heartland. Stay tuned here on the left end of your dial.